Hello and welcome to Weather Snap. It's Friday, the 23rd of September. I'm Alex Deakin and joining me to talk through this week's weather and climate headlines is fellow meteorologist, presenter and podcaster Helen Roberts. Helen, thanks for joining me. Hi Alex, thanks for having me. Lovely to be here. What are we talking about today? What's on the menu? On the menu today, we're certainly going to be talking about a couple of powerful tropical storms. So we have Typhoon Nanmadol and Hurricane Fiona. They've dominated weather headlines this week. Plus, it's the equinox today and there's a week to go in cycle September. Also, we've got the usual weekend outlook and the highs and lows for last week. First, let's clear something up because it has turned a bit colder this week. And uh, now, as you mentioned, it is the equinox. So it's officially autumn in the Northern Hemisphere, however you measure it. Um, so obviously the newspapers got a bit excited this week and started with their first of many, I suspect, headlines about snow this week. So let's deal with that. Any truth in these rumours slash headlines? Yeah, I feel like we have this similar conversation every year, <laughs> Alex, don't you? Don't it's certainly getting colder early next week. And there may be a little bit of the white stuff around, but it's really only on the, the hills of Scotland, as you would expect at this time of year. And the other thing is to mention that the ground is still really quite warm. Even as we go into to the early part of winter, the ground holds on to its, its heat, its warmth for a good few months yet. So we won't be seeing any ice gritters on the roads just yet. <laughs> No need for gritters, no need for ice ploughs, uh, snow ploughs even. And yes, snow on the Scottish mountains in autumn is not really newsworthy. We actually did a, a TikTok on this earlier in the week. So make sure you're following the Met Office on TikTok. And uh, there's much more and a slightly more detailed meteorological look if you check out Aidan's 10-day trend. That's, uh, that's on YouTube. OK, let's get serious now because two really big weather stories that have happened this week, two uh, hugely damaging tropical storms that have had devastating effects on very different parts of the world. Hurricane Fiona is still churning in the Atlantic, still causing some problems, uh, but also in the Pacific, one of the most powerful storms of the year has brought devastation to large parts of Japan. Yeah, an incredibly powerful storm affecting Japan. This one, uh, the, the impacts that I've been seeing on the news and social media have been really sad to see. So there's been lots of flooding, storm damage effect. Japan is pretty well prepared for these sorts of storms. You know, their infrastructure is good. They're used to tropical storms quite frequently throughout the course of the year. But yeah, this one was a serious one and they issued the first, I think the first ever evacuation notice for, for at least parts of the country. I think four million people were asked to evacuate. That's what some of the news outlets were quoting. Four million people were asked to evacuate their homes. Incredible. 1.350,000 people were without power at one point. As you said, widespread devastation. The, the track of this storm was quite interesting as well because it kind of went along the main islands of Japan as well. So it just exacerbated the problems. Um, depends how you measure it, but the joint most powerful tropical system that we've seen so far this year in 2022 at one point, Highest winds were 155 miles an hour. That's the one minute sustained winds. And it hit Japan with winds of 105 miles an hour. But it mostly has been the rainfall that's that's caused the big problems. Uh, one site's recording 726 millimetres of rain in 24 hours, which is about as much as Birmingham gets in a year. So in, in one day. Uh, so no surprise to see that we've seen such huge devastation with the flooding incredible numbers there in terms of the the rainfall and the wind strength and you mentioned about measuring tropical storms slightly differently across different parts of the world but actually something that i find quite interesting is it's not always necessarily about the power or the strength of the winds it's sometimes about the amount of rainfall it's sometimes just about where it impacts and whether it impacts a lot of people or not so it, yeah it's interesting to see impacts not always completely in line with the intensity of the storm necessarily Let's deal with Hurricane Fiona now, because that is the other big story that's been in the news this week. That is still ongoing, still a Category 4 at the time we're recording this, and very close to, to Bermuda. 
this kind of formed or was spotted as a tropical wave just as Nan Madol was forming. So back on the 12th of September, something like that, it was, it was spotted by the National Hurricane Center as an area of concern. And since then, we've just been watching it and watching it named as Fiona on the 15th of September. So just, just under a week ago, hitting Puerto Rico as a category one storm on Sunday, devastated Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic over recent days. And of course, these are areas that were really badly hit by one of the worst storms in living memory, you know, Hurricane Maria back in 2017. A lot of that area still hadn't fully recovered and then hit by this hurricane this week. It has caused fatalities, you know, similar scenes in terms of mudslides and flooding. At one point, the whole of Puerto Rico was without power. Similar kind of rainfall totals as well. 600 millimetres fell in Puerto Rico and around 300 fell in, in 48 hours over the Dominican Republic. The wind's not quite as strong with this one. As I say, it hit as a category one slash two, so 75 to 80 miles an hour. But um, that storm is still ongoing. And since it's left Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic, it's intensified as it tracks northwards, affecting Bermuda at the moment. Uh, Bermuda, again, a bit like Japan, like you said, Helen, is, is more resilient perhaps than some of the other Caribbean islands, uh, but still likely to cause some issues here. Even if the eye doesn't pass directly over, it's still going to be a very close hit and likely to cause some problems because, as I say, it's still a very dangerous system as a Category 4. And then this is the storm that I mentioned at the start of the programme that could be influencing our weather. Now, we're always keen, aren't we, to point out that when we get X tropical storms or X hurricanes heading across the Atlantic, it doesn't necessarily mean bad news for us. It doesn't necessarily mean stormy conditions. They can affect our weather in all sorts of different ways, can't they? So how is it looking for us as a result of X hurricane Fiona? Well, yeah, this is really interesting because it's going pretty much due north. So first of all, it's going to it is going to impact Canada quite directly. And Julian Hemmings, a uh, tropical prediction scientist here at the Met Office, who's been on this uh, podcast many times, was talking earlier about potentially record breaking winds on the west coast of Canada this weekend from this storm system because it's heading due north. Obviously, as you say, it won't be a tropical system by then. It probably won't be a hurricane, but it could still bring very damaging winds to Western Canada. But what it's doing is it, it's what we say is amplifying the weather patterns across the Atlantic. So as that deep low pushes north across Canada, it's actually allowing a huge area of high pressure to develop in the middle of the Atlantic. And that means that we're going to be on the cold side of that high pressure. And we're actually going to introduce northerly winds as we go into next week. So it is going to turn colder across the UK as a sort of indirect consequence of, of Hurricane Fiona heading up that eastern seaboard of Canada. So really, really interesting. Again, something that Aidan picked out in the 10 day trend, which is available on YouTube. If you want to catch that, he talks a little bit about that and how that's impacting our weather. Speaking of the great man, let's catch up with him now and get Aidan's actual forecast. Here's the weather outlook with Aidan McGiven. Since Wednesday, we've been watching a cold front amble its way southeastwards across the UK. And by Friday and the start of the weekend, that amble turns to a dawdle as the front slows down. It develops what we call a frontal wave, which is essentially a little kink on the weather front, which not only slows it down, but can introduce some heavier rain. So what that means is that Saturday, looks likely to be a fairly wet day in the far southeast of England, showery but also potentially thundery at times, along with a strong breeze and those conditions will make it feel on the cool side. Elsewhere across the UK, much brighter skies in the wake of that front, some sunny spells but also a scattering of showers, particularly for northern and eastern parts of the UK. Temperatures fairly widely in the mid to high teens, so not as warm as it has been through the week, but at least in any sunny spells for many, a reasonably pleasant day. And actually, Sunday starts off mostly dry for many. There will be a few mist patches about, and it will be fairly chilly first thing. But for most, Sunday starts dry with some sunny spells, and even in the southeast, it looks a little drier. Now, later on Sunday, another cold front comes along, this time from the north. This will bring some wet and windy weather as we end the day across northern parts of the country, with the risk of gales for exposed parts of northern Scotland, for example. That heavy rain and the strong, blustery winds will push south across the UK during Monday. And behind that cold front, northerly winds will introduce even colder air, so certainly feeling a chill on Monday and Tuesday. And with those northerly winds, we'll see fairly frequent showers as well. Rain and hail at uh, lower locations, but I think for the tops of the Scottish mountains, could even see a few flakes of snow. And then later next week, things start to turn a little warmer again, but also more unsettled. 
Thanks to Aidan McGiven there. And at the start of the programme, we mentioned that today, Friday the 23rd of September, is the autumn equinox. Now, this always causes a little bit of confusion, doesn't it, Alex, amongst the, the meteorologists and the wider community, because there's the equinox and there's the equilux, and they're slightly different, and it is rather complicated. But I think if we can try and boil it down to the basics, so the equinox is a specific point in time on a particular date where the centre of the sun as viewed from Earth crosses the equator. So I, I, I hear that definition all the time. Yeah. I have a degree in astrophysics and I still <laughs> don't understand what that means. It gets banded about as if that as if that makes sense. And to me, it just I mean, I kind of get it when I think about it. It's all to do with the tilt of the Earth, isn't it? But I don't understand how the centre of the sun crosses the earth's equator i don't really get that it's it's because the earth's spinning and the equator's kind of going all the way around i don't yeah i don't quite but you have to kind <laughs> well, of visualize it as a tilted sphere don't you you do and there's an excellent Met office resource there's a video that we'll post in the show notes that explains it all really nicely with some visuals which i think is really helpful yes i that, i have seen that and that did explain it very well that, yeah that is good it's Aiden again, isn't it? I think Aiden. It's Aiden. It, right? it's, it's, Aiden. it's all about yeah. Aiden. Aiden's doing some great work <laughs> on today's podcast. But yeah, that's on YouTube. But the day, the equinox means equal night, right? But it's not equal, is it? That's the thing. That's the, the extra confusing part. So the length of day on the equinox for most places is actually slightly longer than 12 hours and the nights are still slightly shorter than 12 hours. So it's the equilux where the day is closest to exactly 12 hours. So that that's kind of the difference between those two. And this year that falls on Sunday, Sunday the 25th of September for all UK locations. And the reason behind that is because of the way we measure day length. So the day, we say that the day starts when the top of the sun comes above the horizon. That's it, the because the sun is a circle, not a point in space. So, yeah, it's when, the, like you say, the top of the sun comes above the horizon and at sunset, the bottom, the top goes below the horizon. Yeah. <laughs> so you get that extra, there's that extra few minutes. Yes. Where between the top of the sun is still visible, the middle of the sun. So on the equinox, the middle of the sun. No. <laughs> yeah, on the equinox, it's the middle of the sun goes down below the horizon. At yes. the sunset and sunrise the middle of the sun is yes. exactly due east exactly due west and the middle of the sun will go down and come up but we measure daylight so a day is slightly longer because it's the top of the sun and that's why the equilux is a couple of days later there's also the yeah. bending of the light as well again explained in this video much better than i'm doing here on this podcast the bending of the light due to the earth's atmosphere which also has an effect which means actually the sun appears to have come up, even when it's actually slightly below the horizon, but the light gets bent by the Earth's atmosphere. Yeah, it does. But I think you've explained it nicely, actually, there, Alex, that the difference is about whether you're measuring the, the middle of the sun or the yeah. outer edges of the whole disk, effectively. Yes, that's that's the key. That's the key factor. Uh, and yeah, as you said, the equilux actually falls on. Uh, that depends on where you are on the Earth as well. So the equinox yes. is a specific point in time. We often talk about a certain day being the equinox but it's generally the day that the that that certain point falls and this year was early hours of friday morning wasn't it so we're saying that the equinox was on friday but it was like the early hours of a specific yeah. time but the equilux is the day when night and day are at yes. the closest yes and this year for the uk it's the 25th which is also the ordnance survey get outside day so there's a big push for people to get outside. Hashtag get outside will hopefully be trending on Sunday. Yes, Ordnance Survey encouraging people to get outside, be that in the city, in the, in the woods, doing whatever. Uh, and here at the Met Office, we'd like to encourage you to do that as well. And also make sure you look up at the sky because there's always something to see in the sky as well when you're outside. Good for mental health, uh, good for physical health as well. And even perhaps maybe go out on your bike. Are you a big, big cycling fan, Helen? I'm, I'm have to say I'm not Alex. I'm I'm not into my cycling, but I am totally on board with the getting outside. 
Um, and I'm absolutely fully on board with the looking up at the sky and the clouds. As you know, I'm a, a keen member of the Cloud Appreciation Society, yes. um, who had a big day last week, um, Cloud Appreciation Day, the first one, the first one ever. So that was exciting. So oh. we were all outside looking up and taking photos and submitting them to the website. Ah, the cloud appreciation. So, oh, well, I'll check that out. I will check that out. One thing you can't do, though, is look at the sky while you're cycling along. That is, that is dangerous. No, don't do that. And, uh, and shouldn't be promoted. And we're coming to the end of Cycle September. Uh, and to find out more about that, Claire Nazir spoke to Met Office cyclist Helen Mako Yule and here, Charlie Brooke Barnett of the organisation Love to Ride. Love to Ride is an online platform that's all about getting more people to ride bikes. So we have, a, we have a fun slogan, we want to switch cars for handlebars. We were established in 2014 and yeah, we've been doing fun bike riding challenges ever since. So this is not just a UK initiative. In fact, you span many countries. The USA, Australia, New Zealand. So yeah, it's a truly global challenge. And it's not just about people getting on their bikes and riding. You provide an incentive for people to become a little bit more competitive. Yeah, it's all about getting everyone involved. Individuals simply head over to lovetoride.net, set up their own profile and yeah, log their rides earn points. The points are very much set up so you get more for encouraging people. So there's a hundred points up for grabs for encouraging new riders to the platform. And we got some really cool prizes up for grabs this year. We've got a holiday, e-bike, a pizza oven. For someone who doesn't actually own a bike, you're really sort of pushing me in the right direction. Someone who does actually own a bike and cycle all the time is Helen. Helen from the Met Office. Hi. Hi there. So what actually happens in September at the Met Office when you're getting people to be part of this initiative? One of the really special things about Cycle September is that it's all about workplaces competing against each other workplaces of similar size. So the main thing we do to encourage that is we do a lot of promotion. We um, have a Yammer channel called Bicycle Users that staff who are interested in using bikes tend to be part of. We do a lot of chat on there, encouraging each other. We try and organise sort of events and things that might encourage people to take part. So anything from in, in 2018, we did a really big event where we had lots of businesses come down to the street area of our headquarters. We had people teaching people how to do bike maintenance. And I have worked in HQ down in Exeter um, and the Met Office the head there really does have a strong cycle presence. How many people have you got involved on this one? So I'm not sure how many we've got this year so far. Um, Charlie can probably tell us that by looking at the platform, but we've peaked at around 200 people in previous years, which is about a tenth of our entire workforce, which is a really fantastic amount. We're also quite lucky at headquarters in that we have quite a lot of good facilities here as well that make it easier to make that switch, like uh, the ability to get a locker. We've got showers, we've got drying rooms, which are essential if you've been had a particularly rainy commute that day. And it really kind of helps to make active travel a reality. And the Met Office have been past winners. We have, actually. We've been really quite successful over the last few years. I think uh, last year we might have won both regionally, nationally and globally, uh, which is really quite impressive. We've been national champions, I think, for the last five years. Charlie, tell me about some of the key benefits of people cycling. For Cycle September in 2021, globally, we saved 240,000 kilograms of CO2 and 35% of trips were for transportation. So it, that has a huge impact and just emphasise that, yeah, choosing bike, um, choosing a bike over a car. I've just had a look and the Met Office has, in this last week um, saved 999 pounds of CO2 from being emitted to the atmosphere and replaced 212 commute trips by bike rides. So that's really fantastic. Charlie, is it too late for people to sign up and take part? It's never too late to sign up and take part. You can head on over to lovetoride.net. Well, good luck to Helen and her team. And thank you very much to Charlie. Well, there you have it. Cycling, good for your health, well-being and reducing global climate change. That was Claire Nazir talking to Charlie Brooke Barnett of Love to Ride and Helen Mako-Yule of the Met Office. Alex, you are a fan of cycling, aren't you? 
I am. I do try and ride in at least once, maybe, maybe, maybe twice a week. Definitely feel better when I get to work. Just sets you up for the day. Having done done a little bit of a ride, definitely, I find the mental side is absolutely superb. Uh, it really does set you up for the day a lot better. And obviously, if you're uh, into cycling want to get into cycling then the forecast is is all important if you're a fair weather cyclist i, I must admit i'm a fairly fair weather cyclist uh but if you want to check before you go to work make sure you check out the met office app of course okay just before we go time for martin bowles with last week's highs and lows here are the uk daily weather extremes recorded between the 12th of september and the 18th of september the highest temperature of the week was 27.2 degrees Celsius at St James's Park in central London on Monday. In the first non-mountain sub-zero temperature for a while, the lowest temperature of minus 1.7 degrees was recorded at Shap in Cumbria early on Saturday. The largest daily rainfall was 26.4 mm at Port Maddock in Gwynedd, North Wales on Monday. The longest sunshine time was 12.0 hours recorded at Morecambe in Lancashire on Tuesday. The same figure was recorded at Shoebury Ness in Essex on Saturday. That's all for Weather Snap for this week. Big thank you to Martin Bowles. Thank you very much, Helen. Thank you. Thanks for listening. See you next week. Weather Snap is a podcast by the UK Met Office. For the latest weather conditions where you are, download the Met Office weather app.